Oh, hello. Oh, hello. Sorry, we're wearing our masks. We're, oh, you oh, your... There you go. Sorry. All we're right. sitting next to each other in the library, so I hear myself echoing. Okay. <laughs> thank you. There we go. <laughs> I was like, that's distracting me. Um, so basically, we wanted to thank you, Dr. Meek, for meeting with everybody. Um, Sages is just kind of getting together with all the different professors in the department. Um, mm -hmm. So our students can get to know um, our professors and stuff, especially since we've been in a virtual setting for the last year or so. Um, so what we've been doing basically up to this point is um, the professors are taking a little bit of time just to kind of introduce themselves, let students know maybe a little bit of their academic history and their interests, um, the classes that they teach, uh, other interesting tidbits that you think that would be useful for your students or future students. Okay. So I should proceed. Okay. Uh, well, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're muted, Dr. Okay. Meek. I'm muted again? How did that happen? I'm muted. I wonder how. No, you're good. We hear you. It keeps oh, okay. cutting in and out. Okay. <laughs> I didn't mute myself. <laughs> yeah, this, this, I'm Norman Meek. Uh, this is my 33rd year at Cal State. I'm by far the most senior person left uh, around here. Um, and uh, for my background, I went to the University of Kansas. My degrees were in geography and geology. And the reason I got a geology degree is people kept asking me, what could you ever do with a geography degree? <laughs> and so uh, I would decided I'd go get one that I could act, you know, that have some, some money involved, like drilling for oil wells and things. And so I got trained in both. And they were in different colleges of the university. Uh, so it was quite a bit of work. And then I went to Michigan State and studied geography. My master's thesis was on continental glaciation, how thick the glacial deposits are in Indiana and Michigan and Wisconsin and, and Illinois and that whole region. I was looking at well logs to figure out uh, the, the glacial sediment thickness. Then I came to UCLA. And uh, I studied also Ice Age uh, Lake in the Mojave Desert. I did my dissertation on a lake called Lake Mannix. It covers 164 square miles. So I had, uh, I spent years out there going everywhere in this region. And that's why I take students out there to see some of the cool stuff. And uh, it broke catastrophically during the Ice Age. So if you've ever been to Afton Canyon, that canyon wasn't there in the last ice age. That canyon formed when this lake spilled out. And uh, so, and then I've been teaching here uh, since 1989. Uh, the first year I didn't have my PhD yet, but I came to Cal State because the position was open. The guy that preceded me had taken, we both applied for Northern Arizona University and he had gotten the job at Northern Arizona Northern Arizona University. And so his position was open at Cal State. <laughs> it was a Cal State professor that applied. And so he knew me and he invited me there. And so I've been here since then in his, you know, that's how I got the job out here. And from my perspective, it was cutting my drive out to the Mojave Desert each week uh, in half. <laughs> and so I started by teaching four classes. We were on quarters then and taught 12 classes a year my first year and uh, been teaching since. Oh, well, I'm personally happy that you started at Cal State because I was able to take a geomorphology class last semester and it was awesome. <laughs> and had you gone somewhere else, I wouldn't have gotten you as a, a professor. So it worked out. <laughs> uh, you've, you've only got part of that class. I, I know you get full credit for it, but the best part of that class is still yet to come. I am eagerly looking forward to that field trip. I cannot wait <laughs> if you end yeah, up doing it again. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm definitely teaching it in the spring, and there is going to be a field trip. But I just learned camp reserve campground in Death Valley after April 15th. 
And so everything's on a first come first serve basis, which it was before it was a national park in 1994. And I used to run field trips up there with 38 cars. <laughs> and so I know how to deal, deal with it on a first come first serve basis, but I ran trips out there before it was the national park. And uh, the, the, the problem with the national park is uh, they, it just adds lots and lots of rules and lots and lots of people to the, to the system. Um, it actually doesn't preserve things very well because of the crowds that now show up there. There, there wasn't, uh, in the past years, I had run it the weekend before Thanksgiving and usually there wasn't hardly anybody out there on Thanksgiving, um, especially the weekend before. But then we went out there about four years ago and suddenly every campground, everything was completely filled. And there were huge crowds. We couldn't even park at Badwater while we just to see the, you know, the, the, the salt spring there. And uh, what had happened is the K through 12 schools had decided to give the kids off the weekend before Thanksgiving and all of Thanksgiving week. And so we showed up there and, and you know, the whole place was overrun. Um, from then on, I have only gone out there with reservations, but we won't be out there at the high season in, in, in late April or early May. Okay, so I am not a geography major, and I was wondering what field trip are you talking about right now? This is the field trip for geomorphology, Geography 4400. Um, I teach it once a year. It involves a three-day field trip to the Mojave Desert and Death Valley. Uh, when I first started, I did a four-day field trip that went to Utah, Southern Utah, uh, we spent a night in Las Vegas and then came and did Death Valley and all the way back through Owens Valley. So what we do now is it's a three-day trip uh, over a weekend, either Friday through Sunday or Saturday through Monday. And so it doesn't interfere with your other classes. And uh, we go out the first day and look at the Mojave Desert uh, before the... 29 Palms enlarged their military base a few years ago. We used to drive out through Johnson Valley and see the landers ruptures and then go in underground in the volcano at Pisca Crater, the lava tubes the first day. And it was a four day trip. And then the next day in Lake Mannix and then two days in Death Valley. Now we can't go that way anymore because they blocked off the roads. So it's impractical to go see the Black Hawk landslide and see and see uh, the pist the lava tubes. It's just too far out of the way, and so we go out and look at Lake Mannix for a day, which is quite spectacular. And then we spend the night at Zizek's. The next day we get up early and we drive north into uh, Death Valley and uh, see a lot of the stuff there. Camp in Death Valley. The second night and the third night we. Third day, we start at the uh, overview over all of Death Valley called Dante's View. It's a spectacular view. Um, and uh, then drive home by Owens Valley. Yes, so my, uh, I used to do some people who have come here. I do have to go there once. I, I can't hear you. Oh, no, no, you're okay. Okay, I can hear you. Oh, sorry. I'm just, I was mentioning that the Black Hawk landslide was really cool. I was fortunate enough to see it. And it's kind of a bummer that you don't get to take students there because it was a really neat thing to kind of go visualize. It's hard to fathom it without seeing it. Well, I'll tell you what, if Sage's group wants to organize just a volunteer trip out to see that and maybe even the lava tubes, although it's a, it's a hard way to get there. You got to go all the way back around through Barstow to get there. But I'd be happy to show the features in uh, in Apple Valley and then on out to, to the Black Hawk landslide for a day trip. That and sounds maybe, really interesting. I, and maybe then on down. To, <laughs> I was going to say maybe you know it wouldn't have to be out and back. You could go to the to Black Hawk landslide and then we could go down to the Pioneer Town area where there's some interesting basalt flows and stuff and then go down to see 
the, the Mission Creek Fault, Branch of San Andreas and other stuff at Banning Pass and just make kind of a circle to see these things. I've taken the, the, the class, the, the sages, I took them on a ski trip to Southern Utah years ago or, or led that. And one year I took them to the slot canyons in the Mecca Hills that most people don't know about where you can actually crawl up a canyon uh, with flashlights and then it suddenly opens up right on the San Andreas Fault in a big rectangle and then you go back into the canyon on up the valley. Uh, that's a pretty cool feature too. It looks like Sages uh, for you know this year need us plan some trips with you because yes. it looks like you have some really well not looks <laughs> like but it sounds like you have some really awesome trips and I definitely want to learn more about California geography so I think you would be the great professor to teach you know yeah. Sages that so yeah well that's what I'm known for because I've been to all these different spots and in, in the field and out in the desert including I used to run field trips in the summer of southern Utah, we were out there when 9-11 happened even, and they closed all the bridges and stuff, but I used to run a week-long four-wheel drive trip of Utah, uh, and where we drive Canyonlands and all these other places, uh, and camped, and the only way to clean up was to swim in Lake Powell, and, and so I used to do that kind of trip. I, I haven't done that since I'm, I've been married, but um, the other thing you need to know about me is that next year's probably my last year at Cal State. Could be, I might just even be half time next year for all I know. Uh, they, I only have four classes listed that I teach now left in the program. Uh, intro Physical Geography, uh, Intro Physical Geography with Lab, uh, Climate Change and Geomorphology. And there's an expectation I'll teach a four course load. Well, if I don't have four classes I could teach each quarter or each semester, I can't really have a full full time position. So I I don't intend to stay after May of 2023. Got it. Good to know. It's sad to hear, but you know, it's you know, if you want to take some classes with Dr. Meek, you got to get them in now. <laughs> that's right. I, that's why I mentioned that is this basically uh, this coming spring and possibly next year will be the, the it. That will be all the time I'll be doing it. Do you happen to know if you would be teaching climate change next semester? Because I know you're doing it this semester, but is that a once a year class? It, it is right now, and it probably will be. The reason what messed up, got messed up, I used to teach it in the winter quarter, and uh, we do a one-day field trip in that out to, out to the desert. Um, but I needed to teach geomorphology in the spring because it had always been taught in the fall for at least the last 15 years. And the problem with that is when you do it the week before Thanksgiving, you got only about 11 hours of sunlight, maybe 10 hours. So you can't, you know, we have 13 hour nights, 14 hour nights, you know, and, and so you see a lot less. By moving it to the spring in late April and May, suddenly I've got 14 hours of sunlight. You see a lot more if you got a longer day and the nights aren't so just endlessly long. And so to do that, I then had to move climate change to the fall um, to, to fit. I suspect that schedule will stay for the last year. I mean, I'll do geomorphology in the spring and I will do climate change in the fall. But if you're an environmental studies major, the new program, which I had nothing to do, doesn't allow both to count. <laughs> You know, it says I saw that. <laughs> climate change or now it does count in geography. It does count both count in geography, both count elsewhere, but environmental studies. And, and my enrollment was was low this this semester. I'd always taught classes of 23, 24, that type size. And suddenly this quarter it only has eight. Or this semester. You know. And so there's a risk of it being canceled believe it or not. 
still at this point, they would cancel it. Well, the only reason they let it go with age is because people, some people need to graduate. Yeah. Wow. I think this is a change caused by the semesters not allowing both classes to count and thereby much prefer to take geomorphology with the three day field trip. And so they don't want to burn their, uh, you know, burn that opportunity by, by taking climate change, which is sad because both, they don't overlap lap much. We talk one week in geomorphology about climate change, but in, in climate change, we do the whole semester on it, so. Yeah, oh, as Michaela stated that uh, she would have taken your climate change course, but she had to take an orientation seminar. So that's a bummer. I would have taken it too if I had known about it. But I well, it'll be offered probably next fall. Okay. All right. I'll I'll be around. I'm I'm a master's student, so um, it's my first year, um, and I'm doing the social science and globalization program. Uh -huh. So I'll be taking quite a few courses from the geography. So I'm definitely gonna sign up for the fall. Okay. Very good. What else do you want to know about? I would like to open up the floor for like if any of the participants in here have a question for Dr. Beek. This is our, our time to get those questions out. <laughs> uh, you might have mentioned it earlier, but I had you for geomorphology uh, online last year. Uh, you said we didn't really get the full experience because um, I remember you mentioning that there was a field trip to Death Valley. Um, even if we've already taken the course and I, uh, so I'm graduating this December, would we still be able to join um, the field trip that you have for spring? Yeah, I, I wrote to the class uh, when I did teach it and maybe people would have forgotten, but I, I said, I will announce when I know the field trip that dates um, and it's probably going to be between April 15th and May 1st is my best guess right now. But once I've actually created the syllabus for next semester and have field trip dates picked out, I will send an email to everybody in your old class telling you those dates. Now, I can't provide transport for ever, that many people because I have the three vehicles will be for the people in the class that, you know, that are currently in it. But if you are willing to travel behind the group in your own vehicles or you know in a group vehicle type thing that you just cover the, your own gas, I'll have the campground paid for. Um, you're welcome to come along, and I highly encourage it because you see the whole world differently after you spend out you know three days out walking around with me, let showing you what what you're actually seeing. Thank you. You're, yeah, I'd, I highly encourage you to go. Right. Other questions? Where did your passion for geography and geology stem from? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, in my, when I was still a geography major at Kansas, I, we went on a field trip. That's why I do field trips myself so much. And we went out into, and this is a freshman, I was just a brand new student. We went out to, to an empty farm area in Kansas. And the professor had us walk up this just not very high hill. But on top of the hill, we saw all kinds of river gravels, you know, and rounded rocks and everything. And you could see a nice U shaped uh valley that they were in and the question was well how did these rocks get there and that's a surprisingly interesting question out there because it was obvious they were in a river valley but they were on top of a hill how do you get a river valley on top of the hill and then how does it have all these kind of rocks that don't exist in kansas at all <laughs> and uh you know we kept kind of trying to come up with ideas and that was one of the best learning experiences I'd ever had because suddenly the world changed in one day that you have geologic time and that what that used to be the bottom area in the whole region, you know, that's why the river valley's there. 
and gravels and stuff from a much wetter climate have been carried through that area, obviously much bigger than stones and Kansas rivers today. And then what had happened is because it was more resistant to erosion, the rest of the landscape had eroded, leaving this high on the hill because it had more resistant rock in it. And although it was a simple concept for geomorphology, it was stunning for somebody that had never heard any of that stuff. And, uh, and so it was that field trip that got me interested in it. And first paper I had to write was, well, how is our understanding of Earth? Now, this is way back in the 70s now. How has our understanding of, of, of the Earth changed in the last 15 years? Well, this is right after plate tectonics started and got going. And the textbooks had changed from explaining landscapes one way and we had to compare it to a textbook 10 years later that had totally different explanations for why mountains exist and earthquakes and all of that. And so that was really a good learning experience. I had faculty in my career who were pre-plate tectonics and teaching everything from an earlier perspective. So I got the earlier perspective in my education, and then I got the post-plate tectonics, especially at UCLA. And uh, I would just say my next field trip uh, with my thesis advisor at Michigan State, we drove all the way to Michigan, uh, uh, all the way over to Wisconsin from Michigan. And we went to Baraboo, Wisconsin. That's where Ringling Brothers was headquartered. But he took us to the Precambrian rock, the really old rock. And, and what he showed us is he took us out there to the hillside and there were flat lying rocks with uh, beach sands and everything on it right next to this vertical Precambrian rock. And we learned that this was the a Cambrian ocean waves had left these deposits. So these were the actual flat lying Cambrian, that's 540 million year old rock. So flat lying laying right next to, to this steep uh, crystalline rock. And then he took us to the other side of the valley, and you could see the rocks tilted the other way. I mean, the Precambrian rocks. So it was like one big bowl, and and so it with all these marine sediments in the middle of it all, and that was perfectly flat line. And we all thought we had figured it out, especially all the I was a graduate student that time. Oh, this was simply just a bowl filled with with sediments in here that are flat line. But his last stop, he designed the field trip just right. The last stop, we went right into the middle of the center of the bowl. And there's a little hill there. And he asked us, well, what's this doing here? And we went up and looked at it close. It was clearly the Precambrian rock making a little hill right in the middle. And so the question was, you know, everybody that had already, you know, we we're doing this in front of undergraduates too at the time. And we'd all acted like, well, we really knew everything. And then when he brought, took us to that stop and asked us, why is that hill there? Uh, we were dumbfounded because we couldn't explain it. Our model in our minds was just the simple bowl. Well, actually what it is, it's like a cowboy hat. The sides went down and then they rose back up in an anticline right in the middle of it. And the, the, bowl, the bowl was actually the shape as a, as a big cowboy hat rather than a, a, a simple bowl. But when you get your mindset on things and when you told everybody what's going on and everything you're, you know, the a geologic God, you know, and explaining things, and then you're caught like that in front of everybody and totally embarrassed. And I wasn't the only one totally embarrassed, but I was one. Uh, that is such a great learning experience. Because you make models, you make models of how you think the world works, and then he shoots it down. <laughs> I bet it really humbled you at that point. Like, darn, oh, you can't yeah. be so concrete in this science. And, and that was a critical lesson for my lifetime because I've been involved in some really controversial stuff, uh, highly disputed and whatever, and uh, I face those kind of challenges my whole career. 
Um, I, I noticed like a lot of our SAGES members are graduating this year. So I was wondering if you have any SAGE advice for our senior SAGES, any um, SAGE advice for grad school or out in the, out in the real world? <laughs> okay, I do, I do have some advice. If, for those of you interested in graduate school, um, one of the things I learned when I went to UCLA because that was in the top two of, for physical geography in the country at the time, still kind of is, but not, not as much, is that there are PhD granting schools that there are at the top tier, and uh, UCLA was one of them, but Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, Ohio State, you know, some of the top tier that graduate the the, and you can see where those faculty go because they're often they're the first hired kind of you know when they come out of graduate school with their PhD because they were at a really competitive school. The lesson you need to know is you don't want to go to those schools for your masters because all of the, the research faculty and these are research universities unlike Cal State which is a teaching all of their emphasis is on writing papers and working with the PhD students to write papers, in other words, being cutting edge. And what I found is I found lots of really good students there in the master's programs, and they weren't getting the time of day. You now they were being able to go on the field trips and stuff like that, but if they were just getting burnt out because they weren't getting the attention they really needed to really excel and get up to the really top level. Uh, I was really lucky that I went to Michigan State, although they grant PhDs, they were primarily a teaching state university. And so I got all the attention in the world from my advisor there. I just described it, it took us to Michigan, uh, Wisconsin and stuff. He had time and he would sit there on the weekends and I could bring my manuscripts and talk about all, anything I wanted all the time. And that's really where I learned to do the best research was be getting the attention that's needed. And, and so I really felt sorry for the people at UCLA that were in the master's program. These are really good students, several are faculty now that I know still, uh, but don't strive for the top school at the master's level. You gotta learn how to do this research uh, by competent people. And so there's a secondary tier of good schools. I would say in that tier would be things like Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, Michigan State, uh, those those type of schools. In in our our in our uh, state, uh, Northridge, you know, they offer a good master's degree, and you're going to get a lot more personal attention because they don't have a PhD program in the Cal States, but they do have faculty that want to do research. San Diego State would be a, a school like in that tier. And so you, where you get the, the attention you really need to, to, to strive. Also, there's a lot of pressure to stay in wherever you go. Let's say you go to do your master's at, at uh, Arizona State. There's gonna be a lot of pressure if you, you stay on there for your PhD. Realize that when you graduate from this, with your master's, it's really easy to stay there because you already got housing, they already know you, you already know the faculty, et cetera. But once you get out in reality in the working world, the more connections you have at more universities uh, and in your training, more the more diversity of thought that you've gotten in your training and the more people you know, and it's people that you know in academia that are super critical. So I was lucky to graduate from three different universities and I, I would encourage everybody to do that. And, and what students need to know, especially if they're going in academia, is every, if a school wants you, no matter which where it is in the country, they offer an out-of-state waiver for tuition uh, where you're paying in-state just for your fees, uh, which is automatic if you get a teaching assistantship or a research assistantship there, because they realize you'd be paying out a state fee, so they make it in states, be competitive. And secondly, you, the first year you're spending there, you're establishing residency. residency. 
And so you, after the first year, even though it's not waived, you're still, you're still uh, not paying anything extra. So go, go anywhere you want is what I'm trying to say. Don't, you don't have to stay in California because in state, out of state, you can go anywhere. And if you get a research or teaching fellowship or assistantship, it comes with out of state waivers. And at those schools, it's those students, the graduate students, who are actually teaching the labs for the big, you know, the professors that lecture. And so don't be afraid to go to Arizona State or Nevada or, and, and realize one last thing. I won't only mention one last thing. Where you go, do your PhD, it should be somewhere where you want to live because when you finish your PhD and you're done, you know that area where you ended up at better than anything and you're going to likely get the job you know I, I ended up in california i'm teaching in california today uh, if i ended up in kansas i'd be in kansas you know if i ended up in in washington state i'd probably be up there because that's where your connections are that's where the people know your research if you've just done a dissertation usually on their region and so uh, try to keep these things in mind I see too many students that get their master's and their PhD from the same school, and they really just aren't competitive in the, in the top tier job market. Yeah, thank you for that advice. I have some of that stuff, but I've never been told that, especially like going to like different, you know, schools to diversify like the people that you meet and forming connections. So that was great. Thank you, Dr. Me. Sure. Um, I also wanted to say thank you, uh, just because I am graduating in December and I was thinking about taking a year or two off in between before doing my master's just to really, I guess, figure out what exactly I want to pinpoint my major on. But um, now that you mentioned that, that does make you know a lot more sense of going to different places and meeting more people, which is something now that I can consider in my list of, that I have going of places I'm thinking about applying to. So thank you for that. That really- My advice on that would don't take two years off uh, because you get, in, you get, you start working, uh, you get a paycheck and uh, you get commitments like a house payment or something like that and then you can't can't, can't go it, it becomes you know or you get married or whatever and then now it's inconvenient to continue on you don't have to know what you want to do by going there and working with people in their program they've got research projects going on they'll get you involved in that stuff and maybe you'll like some of them maybe you wouldn't you know, I thought I was going to do cartography when I started. I never dreamed I would be doing Ice Age stuff. But, the, you know, you, you get introduced to this stuff and it's so wild. That's where your career goes. Good to know. All right. And the other thing, other thing graduate school isn't expensive. For me, I never borrowed a penny all the way from Michigan State through UCLA. I mean, they, they pay you to teach their labs. So those are called teaching assistantships or to work with their faculty on research projects where you're doing some of the grunt work for their research. These are research assistantships. They come with out-of-state waivers and you make some money. Now, you're not going to get rich. You're not going to drive a Porsche around or, or anything, but you're not going to go into debt is what I'm trying to say, is if you get these this kind of support. And that's how be, the big universities all pay for most of their teaching. Uh, the faculty are just, you know, the superstars that go up in front of 800 and, you know, give a, a lecture two or three times a week. It's all of their lab assistants and <laughs> graduate assistants. They're doing all the grading and all that, but that's how you learn. That's how you learn to do it yourself. And so, uh there's lots of opportunities for that kind of stuff you don't get rich but you're not going to go into debt either other questions let me check the chat really quick to see make sure that there is no one okay answering questions 
I think, yeah, all right, we are good. And then also like speaking about getting into debt, like scholarships, look for scholarships, you guys. Just apply to a bunch <laughs> and, you know, see what, see what happens. Well, I'll give you some more advice on that uh, for applying uh, for the following fall. And every, every university that starts in the following fall, they have to announce by March 15th of the previous spring whether you've gotten any kind of financial support. That way you can make your decision. The UC system has a deadline of February 15th. And what they do is they tell you whether you're going to get a grant in the UC system, let's say UCLA or Berkeley or, or any of the UC systems. And you have to make a decision because you only got 30 days to make that decision before you even heard from the universities around the rest of the country whose deadline is March 15th. In other words, I had to decide, well, am I going to UCLA with a ride scholarship or do I want to wait for the school I really wanted to go to at the time, which was Arizona State? Did I want to wait to see if I got anything there? And so be aware that, uh, that uh, all of these announcements have to be made by March uh, 15th. At Michigan State, I was so busy working at, at my, to finishing up my honors degree at Kansas I was still working there after the graduation ceremony in May to finish up my honors paper. And I hadn't even thought about the future. So I was sitting here in June. I didn't know what I was going to do even in the fall because I hadn't applied. And then I applied to Michigan State and uh, they liked my application enough that they offered me a teaching assistantship. So don't be afraid to also apply after the March deadline because uh, some will be turned down and then they've got to give them, offer them to other people. And they just said, well, we saved one in reservation just in case there was a good applicant, you know, a late applicant. But try to get your applications in uh, so that you can hear by the February 15th deadline if you're going to be in California. Oh, yeah. And then I just realized October 1st is coming up. So if you guys, uh, you know, need to get your fashion, October 1st is the day you should probably do it. Yeah, a lot of the deadlines are November 1st and December 15th and that type of stuff. So uh, you can find out all of this information. There's the AAG, the Association of American Geographers Guide to all of the departments in the country. And I think that's available online now, even for free. And you can check each department and see what their deadlines are and what they expect. And if they have any kind of uh, testing requirements like GRE or, or whatever. And uh, that's available for every department in advance. You also look at their list of faculty and their expertise. Find somebody there that you have heard is a good person or, or teaches something you want to. That's how I picked Michigan State. They were offering three things I was interested in, which is cartography, uh, Russian history, and uh, uh, oh, uh, geomorphology. Those were my three interests at the time. The faculty member I went there to study with wasn't going to be there my first year. He was teaching at West Point as a visiting a professor. He's the best guy I could have ever met to get me to where I am today. Uh, because he taught all three and they were all great and he's the one that had all the connections and he, he knew all the faculty at UCLA and stuff he just called out here and said no you don't want to miss getting this person as I'm saying having all these different connections around the country uh, the more you have you never know how they're going to work behind the scenes so like if I knew you something lots of really good connections there. In fact, you were using their labs. If you took my classes, you were using one of the guys' labs here. So um, it only takes a phone call, you see, to get priority service. <laughs> I was going to say by the time 
by the end of uh, your class, I felt like I knew Dr. Dorn on a personal level, like after all of his lectures and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, he was so wholesome, <laughs> his lecture style. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we're kind of coming up towards the close of it. Um, We've got five more minutes if anyone had any last minute questions or, or anything for Dr. Meek. Well, oh, it's hard to see through this mask. Because, Crystal, okay. give a little round of applause. Oh, okay. Crystal. <laughs> All right. I hope this was useful for you. I think it was. I think it was. It's good. I think um, it's good. It's good for students to kind of get that personal connection with their professors, especially when we've been virtual for so long. So, um, we really we really appreciate all the all the professors taking the time to speak with all of us and and all that good stuff. It's it's always beneficial. Watch your mail and email in December, and that's when I'll send out an announcement of when the field trip dates will be. For you to consider you don't have to decide and say i'm going or not until the day before in fact it's totally voluntary but i'll at least tell you when we're going to be going all right awesome thank you dr meek okay. all right thank you all right thank you thank right. you everyone stay safe and healthy <laughs> all right have a good week everybody all right goodbye bye bye dr meek i love your puzzle yeah. by the way i'm still kind of mind blown by it <laughs> because <laughs> it's freaking huge that's called attention to detail <laughs> yeah seriously Wait, it's a puzzle i need to look a puzzle i did not even know it was a puzzle i thought it was just like wallpaper or something. Uh, it's a twenty-six thousand piece puzzle oh my god <laughs> like i'm just sitting here while you're talking all the time you're sharing all, all this great information but that puzzle in the background has was so distracting because i'm thinking like how did he assemble this did you assemble this on the floor did you have to glue it all together and then how did you put it on the wall like <laughs> i want to know <laughs> well fortunately they it doesn't come uh in one bag it comes in four and each one weighs about 50 pounds oh my gosh Simply because if the puzzle's this big, you'd need a, a whole house to spread them out. And so it enforce. So there's four bags here. Each 6,000 pieces, you can build each 6,000 section. Oh. Then uh, you, you, I took it and turned it upside down and put a, sp a spray fixative, a glue, basically. And you put a heavy-duty burlap back to it, it all sticks to that. And then you can lift it up, it's 200 pounds basically, but you can lift it up and, and then it's all held on the wall by Velcro. Wow, that's, that's impressive. And did you say you built this like, you know, not the, not the picture facing you, you built it backwards or reverse? No, 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 you, no, you build it right side up, but you build it in four separate sections, each 6,000 okay. piece puzzles. And then you assemble it. Got it. Got it. So otherwise, you know, you know, if it's this big, it would take you know three or four rooms just to spread. Yeah. <laughs> <Just that. laughs> That's impressive. I assume yeah, you yeah. don't have any pets or you know. I do have a dog. Oh, you do have a dog. Him. He does have a dog. Oh. I do have a dog. Yeah, but he's been very well. I love dogs. He did kind of. He did kind of chew on one piece, but. It, it got, <laughs> It's cute. It's it's personalized now by the yeah. top chewed on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, they make a bigger one than this. They make one that's two thousand pieces now. Uh, the problem is I don't have any walls in the whole house. <laughs> I, I, I thought about building it for campus and just putting it down the whole hallway wall um, and just give it to them for free. But oh, oh well, uh, can we help work on it? I could, I could buy it or something and we could work on it and put it on the wall because <laughs> it sounds like fun oh. <laughs> it sounds I, know. I like puzzles so you know when you mention puzzles and a giant puzzle, I was just you know <laughs> you have to study you don't have time to goof off yeah that's true <laughs> that is true <laughs>
<laughs> I can't procrastinate, you know, by you know, puzzle making, <laughs> making myself feel productive. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Anyways, all right. I am done with my puzzle, you know, questions. So okay. <laughs> you, Dr. Me. Wait, come, you have to come see it in person sometime. Yes, we should all make a sages trip to your house just yeah. to be the puzzle. And your dog, because oh. we, we are dog fans too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, very good. All right. Thank you, Dr. Meek. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Meek. Okay. All right. Goodbye. Bye, you guys. Bye. This is the awkward part. There we go. <laughs> all right. Stop video.